Open the podcast bay door as hell. Welcome to episode 186 of Welcome to Geek Town. I'm your host, Kurt Onstead. I've been a proud geek all my life, being into role-playing games, board games, sci-fi, fantasy, and especially superheroes and comics. And I want to help others join me in those pursuits, but I've found that sometimes people can get overwhelmed or feel left out because they don't already have what some consider the requisite knowledge to be considered a fan. And that's where Welcome to Geek Town comes in. Here, you can ask your questions without feeling like a gatekeeper is calling you out for not yet being fully versed in every aspect of your new interest. Starting next week, we'll be doing a deep dive on the new Marvel show, Agatha All Along, which, as most of you probably know, is a sequel slash spinoff of the first Disney Plus Marvel show, WandaVision. That was the subject of my very first deep dive with friend and listener Joel L., Obviously, we talked a lot about Agatha during those shows, although her true identity was just a rumor for most of the series, and thanks to a suggestion from Joel, who will be joining me for the Agatha All Along Deep Dive, I decided to edit together some of the discussion from throughout the show, starting with my theories of who Agnes really is, to where we leave her at the end of the series. The biggest chunk of this is from episode 7 of the show, where we find out it's been Agatha all along, and I go into her comic book history once her identity has been confirmed. But nearly every single episode had something about Agnes slash Agatha for us to discuss, with the exception of episode 4, the one that took place entirely in the real world. I'll use the little interstitial sound from our theme song to transition from one episode to another and leave a little gap between multiple discussions in the same show. Of course, if you want to listen to the whole thing, the WandaVision deep dive starts with episode 76 and is available in the same feed where you found this show. But there's nearly an hour of talk to get through, so let's get going. We start with a little bit from the first episode of the podcast, which covered the first two episodes of the show. Take it away, past Kurt and Joel. So, in the comics, she gets pregnant, and it's with the help of Agatha Harkness, who is the woman who helped train Wanda in the use of her powers. And now take the name Agatha Harkness and take the very first syllable and take the very last syllable. Oh, the neighbor Agnes. There you go. Interesting. And Agnes wears a brooch in the second episode that looks like three witches kind of around a a cauldron or a tree or something that's hard to see at, at that size. But the ongoing theories that have been wandering around the comic sphere is that Although it hasn't been explicitly stated, people are pretty sure that Agnes is Agatha Harkness. And so we'll we'll get to see her introduction into the MCU as well. Well, she is certainly the most prominent recurring character so far. Yes, definitely. So Agatha helps Wanda kind of focus her powers in a way that allows her to become pregnant with Vision's children. And she gives birth to two children, twins named Billy and Tommy. Near the end of the episode, we get the cut back and forth between Agnes and Herb talking to Vision and Wanda talking to Geraldine, which obviously ends with Geraldine slash Monica being booted out. But Agnes and Herb present another break in 
the reality to us. And Agnes really seems to know a lot more than any of the other characters from the town. Which, again, being the neighbor that meets up with Wanda and Vision as kind of the point person for the town does make sense. She may not be the head of the various committees, but she is the person who presents herself as being Wanda's friend as soon as they move in. True, but I also think that this is more evidence towards my theory that A, she's Agatha Harkness, and that B, she has at least some control over what is happening or how it's happening. She is more connected to this than the rest of the town. That does fly with her ability to say, no, Herb, stop. Right. But before we get to that, Agnes shows up. Mm -hmm. And we have that breaking the wall moment. Yeah. There were several of them this episode, and I think it's an indicator that she is not in as much control as she was, or she's losing control the more she needs to focus on, as we mentioned last time, that she wasn't focusing on Vision, so Vision lost his glamour. Or it could just be that as she is becoming more aware of what's happening... Uh, which we will talk about later, I'm sure, Yeah, that her conscience is starting to kick in or she's not maintaining as effectively. Mm -hmm. I think that basically it's kind of a cascading effect where the more reality breaks, the harder it is to keep it going and keep that illusion up. Mm -hmm. And it, it also, the original break stems from vision not going along with the script so to speak he says uh you know what i don't want you holding the babies and she's like no yes you do or wanda does wanda wants me to hold the babies and that's the script we're following damn it mm -hmm. so we get more of vision having his own agency and that causing problems in this world yeah and the, well, one thing I noticed specifically uh, when the break happens is not only do we get no audience noise, but... The babies are silent. The babies stop crying. Mm -hmm. And it just completely breaks the world so much that everything goes silent except for this conversation. Yeah. Which is jarring for a number of reasons including we have established a few times that she does not have control over the babies right but the babies crying in a sitcom that would be done with foley mm -hmm. so it kind of makes sense that you know when it breaks and agnes kind of acts like an actress saying do you want to take that over you know do we should we start from the top mm-hmm which I thought was interesting that they use that kind of actor's terminology for all of it. That it felt like like a blooper from one of those blooper shows that we saw so much in the 80s. Right. And so in that kind of world, if reality breaks, or if people break character, then the Foley artist would say, oh, I need to stop this tape and rewind. And so the babies would stop crying in that sure. case. Now, very soon thereafter... Then we get to the kids aging, and Agnes does not react to that at all. No, it, it's just another one of those things. Yeah, so when you combine all those things, it feels so much like Agnes is playing along and is in on it. She knows more than the average resident at the very least, she knows more than the audience watching the Disney Plus show was led to believe that she knew up to this point. Right. So we continue to 
point towards her being Agatha Harkness and having more information and being more involved than most residents. And I love that shot of him looking around the town and seeing that the center of town is active and you can hear kids and all that sort of thing. And then you just pan around and it gets darker and, and quieter. quieter. But he does see one unusual artifact. A car. A car with its lights on and running. This was a moment that we got bits and pieces of in the trailer. Hmm. How it got cut up in the trailer and how it actually ended up playing out gave us very different... Oh, I'm sure we had Agnes laughing and that was supposed to be, Hey, here's comedy! No. It was not comedy. It was creepy as hell. No, no, I mean in the trailer. No, I'm talking about in the trailer. Oh, okay. Yeah, no. In the trailer... We just see him wake her up. She looks at him, says, am I dead? He says, no, why would you ask that? She says, because you are, and it's an immediate jump cut to her laughing maniacally. Oh, that's even worse than what we saw on the screen. (laughs) And that was pretty bad. Except I think there was one moment that was in the full scene that was worse. And that is her just repeating dead. 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 That, to me, was the creepiest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, for me, it took away a lot of the, is Agnes in on this? Is she more powerful than we thought? This really made her a human again. Yes, it did. I completely agree. Because when she was woken up, so to speak... Mm -hmm. She did not seem to know anything more than anybody else had. Right. No, in fact, she was shocked to see Vision as Vision. You're an Avenger! What's an Avenger? (laughs) Right. Which would have been a more powerful, shocking moment if we didn't have last episode's I Don't Remember Anything Before Westview. Exactly. That was not a big surprise. But I'm still hoping that there's more to Agnes, because... She's had so many moments Mm -hmm. that have pointed towards that. I'm hoping that that maybe she was playing along or something, or maybe something got woken up in her when she got changed into the character, and the character knows more Hmm. than she did. I'll be interested to see when the show resolves what the residents remember of what happened in the sitcom world versus their actual lives. Right. I mean, we get the impression that they know these things are happening because they're begging Vision to make it stop. Right. But Wanda has been able to manipulate people's memories in the past. True. And so we could get a mind wipe, kind of a men in black moment and say, sorry for what I did. Let's not have you remember any of it because that's just painful. (laughs) Look into the red light. Exactly. And the other moment in the other line in this conversation between Agnes and Vision that I thought was was very important was no one leaves. Wanda won't even let us think about it. Yeah. All is lost. And that's when she has her psychotic break. Yes. And Vision mercifully puts her back under, basically. Mm -hmm. And she turns around and heads back into town. But Wanda won't even let us think about it. That is disturbing. Yeah. And then we get the another interview segment. Oh man, this one... (laughs) That this is the one that was not funny. <laughs> this is what broke everything for me. My brain just went Quack! in this this interview segment. We actually get the interviewer asking a question, which, as Wanda points out, is not how it's usually done in these shows. We right. never hear the interviewers asking them questions. They just answer questions that were asked off camera that are edited out 
and the question she gets do you think maybe this is what you deserve and now knowing the reveal at the end of the episode the fact that it's agatha asking her that question that's when it felt to me like it was less like wanda is losing control and more like either she only had the illusion of control in the first place Mm -hmm. or maybe someone is actively working against her yeah she is definitely being antagonized in that moment and she does her best to brush it off and ignore it like i said her response is you're not supposed to talk she doesn't acknowledge the actual question itself at right. all. Yeah, not a, to her it's not about the content, but about the context. Right. Then, after the commercial, we come back to Agnes's house. Yes. Which, we don't really see the outside of it at this point, but a little Easter egg for those who enjoy that sort of thing. The house itself, the external view we do get of it later, that is the bewitched house. Are you serious? Yes. They film on the Universal backlot for the exteriors, and so it is the same exact house that Samantha and Darren, and later Tabitha, lived in in the show Bewitched. Huh. But right now we're inside the house, and we get Billy noting that Agnes is quiet. It's quiet here. You're quiet, Agnes. On the inside. Yeah. And so, like I said earlier, I think because Agnes is the only one that does not have another person inside. Screaming to get out. Yes. And so that's why Billy doesn't hear anything from her. Yeah, I think that's totally valid. Now, she does say, Ralph says I sugarcoat things. Have we ever met Ralph? No, she has referenced Ralph multiple times throughout the show, and Ralph has been a non-existent character. There are other examples, Maris in Frasier, Vera, Norm's wife in Cheers. Those are the two big ones that are coming to mind right away. Right of characters who are referenced but never seen which is totally a sitcom thing but this particular show it seems like if something is being referenced and not seen then there may actually be something there or maybe there is nothing there maybe she has made up ralph that's a complete possibility there is no character named ralph that agatha is tied to in the comics well but ralph could be a reference to someone else. Right. Ralphisto. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the devil saying you sugarcoat things. I love it. <laughs> oh, Agatha. <laughs> You're way too nice to everybody. Well, that is something well, the devil loves. Yeah. <laughs> And Wanda and Monica's conversation here has a few moments in it that I want to touch on. Okay. Don't let him make you the villain. And her saying, maybe I already am. Yeah. Well, again, looking back on the first six episodes and looking at this world as being something that was kind of forced upon her... Agatha has been manipulating Wanda this entire time and manipulating her mind this entire time so that A, she would go more insane and B, so that she would see herself as the villain and be okay with Hayward doing what he's going to do. I mean, in a lot of ways, this world is not just a let's get the kids, let's get Mephisto into this world, but it's also let's cover our tracks. Yeah, let's put the blame on it with Wanda. Mm -hmm. Let's do this horrible, evil thing and point the blame at someone else. Yep. Multifaceted, multi-layered, but the maybe I am the villain, that's all... From Agatha's... 
implants. Yeah. yeah, manipulations. Speaking of which, Monica starts talking about her loss and accepting it. And it looks like she's starting to break through. It looks like Wanda might actually listen. Can't have that. And so Agnes interrupts Mm -hmm. and takes her away and takes her back to her house. And then the town kind of goes back to normal and everyone's just like, do 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 nothing yep. to see here. I'm making my deliveries. <laughs> <laughs> and now there was Senor Scratchy in the cage. Mm-hmm. And what was on the curtain? Was it a beetle? Was it a cockroach? Was it I a thought it was moth? just a fly. It was bigger than a fly. It is definitely an unusual creature to be inside of a home. Yeah, and not just that, but it's one of those things that we haven't seen anything like that in this world. You know, the Westview doesn't have pests. rain, doesn't have pests. Yeah. Things are breaking down. Well, I don't think of this one as as a breaking down. I think of this one more sinister than that. Sure. Because well, everything about the interior of this house is dark. I mean, Wanda's house is bright and airy and spacious, and this is dark and cramped and closed in and oppressive. Yes. And so, yeah, absolutely, this is the house that would have these weird insect things. Uh, yeah, and those kinds of creatures are associated usually with demonic forces. Mm-hmm. If it is just a very large fly, and there's Lord of the Flies, Beelzebub, sure. and beetles are usually kind of associated with, like, Egyptian dead and all that sort of thing. So, yeah, yeah they, there's usually some sort of dark association with insects and the powers behind them. Yeah. And so now Wanda finally asks about the twins, and Agnes says, Ah, oh, they're probably just playing in the basement. Always a good sign. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, you a always, decision was made there. You always want to send 10-year-old kids down into the basement to play. Sure. <laughs> that's probably just Ralph's man cave. Yeah, well, we find out. Probably because... is. <laughs> it, it might be, <laughs> depending on if Ralph is Ralphisto. Uh <laughs> Because Wanda goes down into the basement and finds a dungeon castle looking path into a domed room with sigils around all of the arches. Mm -hmm. With weird plants, vines wrapped around each other and themselves in twisted ways. And oh, the whole thing is effectively creepy. Yeah. And I didn't have time to go back and try to find examples, but those sigils to me look similar to what I think of as some of the sigils in Doctor Strange. Okay. Like, specifically, the doorways to various sanctorums. Right. So, there may be some sort of travel aspect there, or it may be just similar magical sigils. Because Agatha, her powers are based in magic, just like Doctor Strange. Right. And we get a book with glowing energy around it in this dungeon. And Marvel Comics has a book that is very important, and it is called The Darkhold. It's shown up in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. in the same season that had the Ghost Rider in it. Mm Mm-hmm. This one does not look the same as the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. one, but I think that Marvel television has been abandoned and is no longer considered canon to the MCU for the most part. Yeah, I think you're right. And so they could use a different prop and still have it be the Darkhold. And the Darkhold is basically the Necronomicon. It is tied to the Old Ones and their powers. So that is my assumption as to what that book is. I think that's a reasonable assumption. 
I just want to see Agatha going Klaatu Verata. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll notice that the book is glowing with red energy. I did notice that. Rather than purple energy. So my theory is that they have been draining from Wanda this whole time her energy because her powers are shown to have the red color to them whereas agatha's powers we see have a purple aura and so the fact that this book has red tendrils of energy around it seems to me that it is being powered or it is related to wanda's energies and so it is sucking that away from her to power up whatever it is Agatha wants to do. Right. And it's also differentiated from, for example, Billy's power, which is shown to be in hues of blue. Ooh, nice catch. Yes. We only get that once in the Halloween episode, but yes, that is a definite blue tinge to his power when he stops Tommy in his path. Mm -hmm. And the other time that we have seen specific colors associated with specific powers is with the various stones the Mm -hmm. you know the reality stone being the red the tesseract being blue well actually the tesseract was the mind stone wasn't that yellow no the scepter is the mind stone the scepter is the mind stone the tesseract was space space yes okay so that one was blues blue Did we have a purple? Yes, the Power Stone Hmm. from Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1. Right. So, I mean, it's it's also possible that these powers that we're seeing are somehow associated with those. That's true. And some of those make sense. You know, we've talked about the fact that Wanda's powers seem to be Mm reality-based, and the Reality Stone was red, and... Agatha seems to be trying to collect power. Right. And her powers are purple, like the Mm -hmm. Power Stone. So, yeah, it could all be related like that. In Infinity War, I I don't remember if it was Infinity War or Endgame, but in one of those, we basically get told that these stones not only formed with the universe, but help form the universe. Right. And so the fact that they got destroyed, it could be that there are new objects out there or possibly people who now represent, yes, who represent those same aspects of the universe. It could be. What they said in Endgame was that the stones couldn't really be destroyed. They were just atomized and spread. So they were dispersed amongst the galaxy, which I would think would give lots of people access if they had the ability to tap into it. Right. It's possible. Now, let's get down to the big reveal. (laughs) It was Agatha all along. Ah, uh, such a great song. Yeah. And you noted in our pre-conversation that the actual title is... It was blank all along. Uh, if you watch the ending credits past the special effects ending credits, but the ones that are actually just text and find that one slide that has the song in it there's a bunch of studio singers from la who i believe i know some of from the acapella world strangely enough but the song title itself was it was underscore 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 all along that's the title of the song which is great because when you publish a song like that you have to copyright it Mm -hmm. and so if they had copyrighted that song before the show was released, then somebody could have easily found it and spoiled for everybody that Agatha was the villain behind this show. Right. So that's a very nice way of them avoiding spoilers. Mm -hmm. And I've mentioned her a little bit and her comic book history, but let's, let's get a little deeper now that we have had this confirmation 
Yes, now that it's been confirmed who she is. Because mostly Agatha in the comics has been on the good side of things. I got that impression from what you've said so far. It kind of surprised me when we were talking throughout this series that this character that I thought was a, a quote-unquote good guy would potentially be the one in charge of all of this. Right. So the first time we meet Agatha Harkness is in Fantastic Four 94 when they hire her to be Franklin Richards' nanny slash governess. Okay. <laughs> and we suspect something is unusual about her very quickly, but she doesn't actually reveal her magical abilities to the Fantastic Four until issue 110. That's some time. She just had an excellent reputation as a nanny, and so they convinced her to come out of retirement to help take care of Franklin. She can put those kids to bed like magic. <laughs> Agatha is portrayed as much older, not just in actual age, but in appearance, than Catherine Hahn is. When we see Agatha from her very first appearance, she, is, she looks more like Aunt May in the comics than like Catherine Hahn. Hmm. And she's got the gray hair up in a bun sort of thing. Well, more more a bouffant than a bun. So she has that, that really tall gray hair all held back behind her and wears a brooch on her neck, similar to the brooch that we see Agnes wearing through much of the show. Mm -hmm. And over the years, we have learned some of her history. She is old enough that she remembers Atlantis sinking and eventually took up residence in Salem and was present for the Salem witch trials. Okay. But she was one of the people turning in some of the witches, hmm. believing basically only the strong survive, that... If they are obvious enough to be caught, that they shouldn't be in the coven. Okay, but that's still kind of an extreme way to go about weeding them out. Yeah, so most of the time she has been on the side of good, but she is willing to take very extreme measures to do what she thinks needs to be done. Chaotic good. That would be a very accurate D&D &D alignment description of her, yes. And so she, after the Salem Witch Trials, she and the remaining members of her coven left and formed their own town in what eventually became the state of Colorado. So she went way west mm -hmm. very early and founded the town of New Salem, which was much more friendly to witches and mystical beings and such. And she had a son named Nicholas Scratch. Wait. <laughs> so you're saying that Senor Scratchy? <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> She also, in the comics, has a familiar name that is a black cat named Ebony. So it could be a little bit of combining of aspects of her comic book character there. But her son has kids of his own who become the Salem's Seven, who take over New Salem and end up burning Agatha at the stake because they don't agree with her way of doing things. Hmm. And then Agatha comes back with no explanation given. Like you do in comics. And this is when she meets up with Wanda and reveals the fact that the children, that Tommy and Billy, are actually fragments of Mephisto's soul. And Agatha is the one who, after the battle is over and the kids have been reabsorbed into Mephisto, she says, well, Wanda can't deal with this, so I'm wiping her memory. 
And so Wanda doesn't remember having kids at all because of Agatha. So there is definitely precedent for Agatha having mind powers. Yes. Well, she has magic powers, which means she can do pretty much anything as long as she knows the spell for it. And then because Wanda gets her memory wiped, but the rest of the Avengers who are there don't. Okay. And so at one point, Wasp makes a comment in a conversation with Wanda about her sons and Wanda starts to remember her kids and that's when she has her breakdown which leads into the house of M that we've talked about right but before she goes full house of M one of the things she does is she tracks down Agatha and kills her for removing her memory so these two are antagonistic they are, except that Agatha was also the one who helped train Wanda in using her chaos magic, who trained her to become an actual witch rather than just a mutant or mutant-like person with semi-mystical powers. Right. She also ended up helping when Wonder Man died and his soul was connected to Wanda. There was a story in Avengers where when Wanda needed him, she could basically kind of bring Wonder Man out and he was a being of energy. And so Agatha is also the one that helped separate the two so that Wonder Man could live again and be his own separate being. So since the Scarlet Witch and Vision miniseries, they have been very closely associated with one another even though she started as a Fantastic Four character. But how their relationship has been portrayed has gone from mentor-teacher to antagonistic and back again, because Wanda used her magical abilities with the help of her actual birth mother's soul, resurrected Agatha. The Scarlet Witch had her own solo miniseries fairly recently, actually, just in the last couple of years, where she was using her her witch abilities, using her, her full magical abilities to help people out. And she basically found her birth mother's soul and was able to communicate with her, but they needed to bring back Agatha because of how important she is to the world. And so Agatha was resurrected once again. <laughs> and currently, the last time we've seen Agatha, she has been helping the Daughters of Liberty, which is a group that is entirely made of women that are allies of Captain America. So includes Peggy and Sharon Carter and uh, Shuri, Black Panther's sister. Mm -hmm. And so that is the last time we have seen her is, is recently in the pages of Captain America. And that is basically the backstory of Agatha. So you can see what I was saying where she has mostly been on the good side of things, but... She's willing to take actions that most heroes would not take. So if she is actually a villain in this show, as they seem to be pointing towards at the very end here, that is a new take on her compared to what we've seen in the comics. Right. Well, one thing that they have shown in this series so far is that characters are more than they appear to be yes and this could be a uh severus snape kind of thing where yes they are doing that he's slytherin it's very clear he's antagonist to our heroes but he is on the side of good right or it could be that she's being controlled in some way by again i'm, I'm still sticking to my mephisto theory in that he is going to be the big bad in the very end. Or some sort, I mean, again, because we now see what could be the Darkhold, 
So it could be that it's not Mephisto, but some other old god sort of thing. But Agatha could be under that control. Right. Uh, she could have been looking at some spell book to try to get more power and released something that possessed her. When you look into the void, the void also looks into you. Yes, that is true. And so once we get the Agatha reveal, and we then get Agatha's theme song, which we pointed out some of the... The moments. Moments there. But very obviously a Monsters that, yes. homage. And I really loved how the theme song went through all the time periods. How yes. the, the scenes that we see during it show all of the background of what she was doing mm -hmm. but again the when she does her reveal you see her eyes kind of glow purple and then wanda has in purple special effects the kinds of things that she was doing in age of ultron to other people yes of impacting their minds yes yeah and the the purple glow goes from agatha's eyes to wanda's temples mm -hmm. which is always a signification of mind control or putting in of thoughts some sort of mental intrusion mm -hmm. and so i'm betting that the theme song is basically what wanda is seeing in her head right and again this is where all of the theme songs all of the commercials wanda is the audience right and we end with the opening theme song with Agatha crossing the line. She killed the dog. Right. <laughs> she killed Sparky, which if you kill a dog, you're evil. There's, right. <laughs> there's no going back from that unless she is controlled somehow. Right. Okay. In the meantime, we go back to Salem 1693 with Agatha being tried and executed yes although not much of a trial not even in 1693 standards that was not much of a trial no w one has to assume that any decision they had come to was already arrived at before the execution this was less of a trial and more of a We've Carrying talked it over. <laughs> We've yeah. already talked it over, and you don't get a defense. Yeah. And it looked to me like they de-aged Catherine Hahn in this scene. Did you notice that, or did it? it... I don't know if it was as much a de-aging digitally as it was just strategic use of makeup. She did look a bit younger, but not obscenely so. No, it wasn't drastic. It wasn't a Michael Douglas in Ant-Man right. sort of thing. But it was noticeable to me that she looked much more like a, not quite a teenager, but a young adult, as opposed to Catherine Hahn's current age, which I would think it would be late 30s, maybe? Or 400 in late 30s? Well, Catherine Hahn, not Agatha. Okay, got it. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> but she is accused of betraying her coven, and she disputes the charges, saying she just wants to be taught. Yeah, and it was, you stole information, essentially. You used power that was above your station. Right. And you used dark magic, whatever that means. Yeah, when you're talking about a coven of witches like this who are willing to execute someone with no defense. Right. What is dark? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's a consistent thing in most society. Yeah, how do you enforce rules when the rules that are being broken are the ones that you're using to enforce the... I mean, what? where's the morality in that? And that's widespread to this day. Mm -hmm. True. So, because of her defense and other various things in this episode, we know it's been Agatha all along, but is Agatha doing this for the wrong reasons? 
It's so unclear. You know, we talked in our last episode that in the comics, she's kind of chaotic good. Right. In this, she's, thus far at least, she very much appears to be chaotic neutral. Yeah, I could see that. And she's not interested in doing the right thing. She seems to be interested in, again, as you said last time, gathering power. Yeah. And speaking of power, in this scene, she gets the blue energy that hits her from all sides. And then, did you notice her expression when the purple energy started coming out? It seemed a little bit surprised to me. Yes, I completely agree. She looked as surprised as the rest of them that this happened and that she had access to this power and was not going to die. Yeah, and her defense prior to that was that she didn't mean to steal these pieces of information and do this stuff. All of it just bent to her power, which, I mean, that appears to be what's happening here. Yeah, so again, because of th these sorts of things, I wonder if... We still have another outside force at play? Yeah, especially since... We didn't see or talk about the book at all in this episode. No, we did not. I very much noticed that. And Wanda runs out from the stage, and that leads immediately to the outside of her house. And we see Tommy and Billy trapped in Agatha's energies. And the outfit that Agatha is wearing is the closest she has come to Agatha's traditional costume in the comics, where she's wearing the big shawl and the purple dress with the brooch right at the collar. So she is in full Agatha mode at right. this point. And this is where she gives us the line and gives Wanda her silly code name. Yes. Let's get into the fight between Agatha and Wanda. It starts off real quickly with Agatha absorbing Wanda's magic like she did with her coven and saying, I take power from the undeserving, it's kind of my thing. And based off of the way that you described this character in the comics, it never was before. No. You know, the MCU has been very good at taking characters and using them for what they need for the story. And if that means altering who they are from the comics somewhat, then that's what they'll do. For instance, the scrolls in... Marvel Comics have always been the villains, and we get to Captain Marvel, and they're basically the refugees, the victims. We get that tease of them being the villains. We get, they do that uh, misdirect of making right. them look like the villains at first, but then we find out that they're not. They play a lot with our expectations, and so... You know, this entire time I, I was thinking, you know, maybe she's doing this for a good reason. Maybe Agatha is trying to give Wanda much needed therapy to accept her loss and, and move on. But no, she no. she is full on villain in this one. We started off in our conversations with, okay, in the comics, she's she's apparently chaotic, good, and... In the show, she seems to be more chaotic neutral, but maybe they'll reveal some chaotic good in there. Uh, they went the other no, direction. <laughs> no, yeah. she's And she keeps calling Wanda the source of chaos magic, but she's just the source of chaos. Yeah. Yes. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Darkhold and how it's been portrayed, because... I don't remember if this was cut out or not, but the Darkhold has shown up in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and in Runaways. I forgot about it in Runaways. Yeah, and it's handled very differently there than it is here 
And it's also handled differently from how it is in the comics. Mm -hmm. All three of those portrayals are at least somewhat different. So in the comics, the Darkhold was created by, I've always pronounced it as Cthon. It is C-H-T-H-O-N. So pronounced similar to Cthulhu. Yes. So the Darkhold was created by Cthon and contains all of his evil works and spells and has been kind of a MacGuffin in the comics as a source of power and an evil spellbook. In fact, there was a series in the 90s when Marvel Comics had split up all of their titles into very specific groups. So there were the Spider-Man titles, there were the Marvel Heroes, which was basically the Avengers titles, and there was one group called the Midnight Suns. Okay. And that was Ghost Rider, the Night Stalkers, which are some of the vampire hunters in the Marvel Universe. And there was one title specifically called Darkhold. Hmm. And there was this being that we just refer to as the Darkhold Dwarf. You know, he looked kind of like the dwarf in the Red Room in, in Twin Peaks. Okay. <laughs> and he would go around with these envelopes that had pages from the Darkhold in it that would cast a spell and grant somebody some sort of wish that they wanted, but at a cost. Twisting what they wanted and releasing some sort of evil power. Standard genie stuff. Yeah. And there was a family, the Montessis, who were charged with keeping the book out of the wrong hands and that sort of thing. And they were... It followed them as they tracked down these pages and tried to get them back and keep them under lock and key. And then in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Runaways, the Darkhold basically contains all knowledge, if you can figure out how to access it. In the comics, if you have a page in front of you, you can read it and you can do the spell. You don't have to be any sort of... Special mystical pre being that can read the darn thing. Exactly. There's no special key to unlock it. There's nothing that needs to be done. You can just open it up and start reading. Or open that envelope and pull out the page and start reading that page. Always a good idea. Yeah. Now, in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and in Runaways, you had to do a special ritual to be able to reveal the pages. It showed as completely blank until then. And... Weirdly, it was almost completely used to show people how to make certain technology. Okay. In Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., it was responsible for the framework and the life model decoys. It helped bring that technology into the world. As we've discussed in an earlier episode, I think that the Marvel television side of things has been basically retconned out. And so the Darkhold, when we see it in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Runaways, it is a completely different prop from what we see in WandaVision. And in oh, yes. WandaVision, it is a grimoire. It is a magical tome that contains mystical knowledge and spells. But as Wanda starts to accept this, she says, okay... I'm going to let you go. Well, she doesn't She doesn't say that without prompting. It's Agatha that really prompts her deciding to end this thing. When Agatha says heroes don't torture people. Right. So again, she's kind of straddling that line on the good and evil thing, but I, I really do believe that the whole purpose of doing that was to push Wanda over the edge to a point where she would either voluntarily or involuntarily give up her power to Agatha. Oh yeah, I, I completely agree. Her her motivation is all about getting power. Yeah. Taking Wanda's power away from her. Which really, again, goes back into this suspension of disbelief, <laughs> wibbly-wobbliness, 
of she knows Wanda did this from the very, very beginning. Why does she need to know that she's the Scarlet Witch? She's a super powerful witch, and taking power away from the super powerful is Agatha's thing. Why go through the motions? It might be necessary to figure out exactly what kind of power it is. That There's aspects of it that I could see her wanting the, the knowledge before she absorbs it. Yeah, I can see that. And of course, the other thing is she needs to push Wanda and push Wanda and get her to a point where she is willing to attack. Yeah, because that's the only way that she can absorb Wanda's absorb Wanda's power. Apparently, right? Uh, as far as From what we see, as as far as we see, the the only way she absorbs Wanda's power is when Wanda attacks her with it. Right, which is consistent with what we saw from the 1600s. Yes. But let's not walk away from that moment for, so quickly. You live here now. Where? Westview. Yeah, but but where? She didn't make him make Agatha a new house. She's not going to live with Ralph. Where does she live? Some empty house in Westview because Which there were plenty of Yeah, there were properties available. Yeah. She's going to live with Agent Franklin. <laughs> I was going to get there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she'll be somewhere, but there's a lot left kind of hanging there with how is this going to work, but that's not important to this story. Right. I think that's the perfect place to end that conversation for now. Joel and I will pick things up next week after we've seen episodes 1 and 2 of Agatha All Along, then continuing weekly until the double episode finale. As always, patrons will get an early, uncut edition of our discussions, available for just a dollar per month. You can join by going to patreon.com slash welcome to geektown. And as always, your own thoughts and theories are greatly appreciated. You can email those or suggestions for future scripted episodes to welcome to geektown all spelled out at gmail.com or you can go to the website welcome to the number two in this case geektown.com and click the submit a question link if you prefer to remain anonymous other contact options include facebook.com slash welcome to geektown twitter at geektown podcast mastodon at welcome to geektown at mastodon.social or blue sky at welcome to geektown.bluesky.social. You can also help the show grow by subscribing and giving a five star review over on Apple Podcasts to join the Geektown City Council, which helps other people find the show so we can all tell them Welcome to Geektown, population, us. Welcome to Geektown is written, narrated, edited, and produced by me, Kurt Onstead. Theme music is by Aaron Levitz, logo art by Archie's Antenna. All their sound clips of the copyrighted material, their respective owners, and no infringement is intended, falling under fair use. 